Welcome to the inaugural season of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. I'm your host, Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm joined by my co-host, Yasha Kekas-Wolf. This is the inaugural season of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley podcast, but what some of our listeners may not know is that the name of the podcast comes from an article that you wrote how many years ago, Sunil, when you were 12? <laughs> One year ago, after a uh, backpacking trip, I was inspired. I guess three days of no technology inspired me to write the piece. I didn't know that. Is that how you get funny? Like, you're a funny writer. Do you like go away, disconnect, and then you come back and you're automatically funny? Well, in this particular trip at 12,000 feet, being out of shape and roughing it in the woods with nothing, including no toilet paper or, well, let's not get into those details, but let's just say disconnecting from technology has an effect on me. When I read your blog post the first time, there was something about it that resonated for me. Like one, I think it's funny because it's satirical and I can personally relate to it because I live here in the Bay Area. But the second piece is that underneath all that kind of satire, there's a little bit of a love letter to the Bay Area. There's so much kind of fun and weird stuff that's happening here that we can really relate to. I just really appreciated that. Was that something that you were trying to go for? I think the Bay Area loves to be hated in a way. And there is a bit of a reckoning that we're facing right now. And maybe while we like the attention, we're getting a little bit too much of that attention right now and not so positive a way, but it does read as if it is a love letter to the Bay Area while at the same time is somewhat critical. Well, I think you're right. There's a really deep fascination with the Bay Area and it's right now. There's a ton of skepticism that's happening that we see play out in the national news and it's actually happening globally. At no point has the uh, Bay Area been more important yet more reviled than this period that we're going through right now. And until we figure out and really communicate to the outside world in a way that, you know, has some EQ associated with it, then the rest of the world is going to continue to be skeptical. And I think what you and I are doing by bringing these guests is, in a way, demystifying what's going on here and perhaps both inviting new skepticism, but sharing that maybe some of the things that we're doing are not so bad and some of them are worse than you think. We've got some awesome guests on this podcast over the first season from CEOs and founders of coffee companies to local experts in the cultural zeitgeist that have had a relationship into local politics to investors to product experts. Like, you name it, we run the gambit. It's a really cool group of people. The key here is, you know, we did not want to have exclusively guests from the technology industry. We do think trends like avocado toast and expensive coffee are things that are happening here right now that you see independent articles written about. We wanted to bring people from a wide range of backgrounds to talk to us. Uh, What's your favorite restaurant to get avocado toast in the Bay Area? There is a restaurant called Avocado Toast in San Mateo that seemingly has no avocado toast in the entire restaurant. It looks as if it's a repurposed Subway. There, seriously, there's an avocado toast restaurant in San Mateo? Yeah, I, uh, I don't want to uh, defame the restaurant in any way. Um, I've actually never purchased an item from avocado toast, but I'm not much of an avocado toast guy myself. Should we talk about some of our guests? Yeah, we should talk about some of our guests. Uh, James Courier. James is a fascinating guy, and he's backed some of Silicon Valley's most important companies including Lyft. It it was great having this discussion about Uber and Lyft with him and hearing his perspective. I I think that this idea of values and its relationship into Silicon Valley in particular in the Bay Area is a really interesting one. And it's hard to find somebody who represents the idea that investors care more about just making money. Like James clearly has been a very successful person, but when you listen to him and what I remember so much about when I first met him is that He is just a genuinely kind, nice, and caring person. He also happens to be a venture capitalist. And sometimes those two things don't come together. A little bit about his background uh, before we get into this interview. James has been an internet entrepreneur for a long time. In 1999, started a pioneering social media company called Tickle, which he sold to Monster. And, you know, uh, in your head, you can make your own jokes about Tickle Monster. Uh, but uh, the fact remains that it was at the time a pioneering company. And I have never put that together. Tickle Monster. Like, that's fantastic. The 12-year-old in me loves that. I, I just I just had to throw it in there. But James is a multiple-time successful entrepreneur, as we said. He, he also has started uh, ventures in the gaming world, including a company called Wonderhill. And most recently, James started NFX Killed, 
which is a calendar-based program for networks and marketplaces where NFX Guild invests and advises uh, companies that w- that are based on everything that James learned from his past companies, which is in business is created by companies with network effects. And, and the guy is just awesome. Like, this is one of my favorite discussions that I've had. Forget about the, just this podcast, but yeah, in this podcast in the last couple of years with an investor. Like He's just a great, great person. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as we had doing it. Thank you for joining us today on This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. What we generally do is we like to start and talk about kind of what got you excited about moving to San Francisco. And the frame that we'd love to hear your story in is talking about kind of where you grew up and maybe not necessarily just where you spent your time, and but maybe some of the more meaningful points in your life where you moved away from where you first were born. So I was born in, um, in Oklahoma, but very quickly moved to New Hampshire. So I grew up in New Hampshire and my parents were teachers. Uh, my dad, a French teacher, and my mom, a music teacher. And, and they were always looking for their intellectual equals. And, you know, that was some work in New Hampshire. And I could sense that even as a kid, they would pull together these dinner conversations and I would listen and, and they would talk for, you know, three to four hours and they would stay on the subject. The, the semantic in our family was, you know, geopolitics and yeah. economics and, you know, the nature of homo sapien. Uh, those, and I would, I grew up with that. And, but there wasn't a lot of that in New Hampshire. And so, um, Later on in life, when I when I started a, an internet company in '99 in Boston, we started growing and we couldn't hire, yeah. so we kind of had to move here. The only place to hire was out here, and so uh, I had known that San Francisco was kind of cooler than Boston, and Boston was no, the number two market. But I'd hoped to sort of make my mark in the number two market and. Couldn't do that anymore. When you say cooler, do you mean like cooler from a professional perspective or cooler from a like a cultural perspective? Or what cooler like, from a cultural perspective? It was a bigger market. It was ranked number one in all the on all the tech media and and um, they just had the more interesting companies. Yeah. And the kids just seemed you know, I was twenty five at the time or whatever, and the kids just seemed like they had, were hipper, you know, than we were. We were kind of old fuddy duds, you know, just <laughs> going along in Boston making, you know, yeah. internet switches and stuff like that. So we moved out here, and um, it, it was incredible. It was like coming home. You know, it's it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. Uh, it's a way of talking. It's it's what subject matters interest you. And everywhere I went, from you know, the early guys here in the in the late '90s, you know, who had also moved from New England. It's like um, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where everyone gathers around Devil's Tower because they're being called by the aliens. I felt, <laughs> I felt all of us coming from all over the country and the world because of a personality type. Yeah. And that personality type is more open. Yeah. In Boston, people don't share information. In New York, they don't share as much information um, easily and quickly. Yeah. And it was the speed at which people wanted to do things. They, they weren't constrained by the pace of life that academia had taught us for yeah. our first 21 years, which I think is far too slow. Sometimes if there's a knock on the Bay Area, it's that that kind of openness shows up as very transactional. And th- has that played anything for you, good or bad, having grown up in an environment where your parents could have helped you see how to hold a conversation about something really important? I have felt a transactional approach, but that's because people are busy doing stuff. Yeah. They're, they're too busy to, to, to waste time. Mm-hmm. And I kind of appreciate that. On the other hand, I feel a really fierce loyalty. You know, I think that, you know, a friend of mine said it best. He said, you know, we're all very driven and egotistical in, a, in, in an okay way, but we overcome that with fierce loyalty to one another. And I, and I thought that was so apropos, and I feel that way about the people that I'm around. Yeah. Even though we are doing business, even though we see each other at these conferences, even though our kids are in the same soccer team, it's somewhat transactional because everyone's so busy. But at the other hand, people, when they do stop, they look you right in the eye, and they're right there. They're right there, and they won't screw you, and they, they try to help you. They're honest about wanting to help in general, and I, I feel that that, that culture has been changing. I, yeah. think, I think that culture, for me at least, peaked around 2004, 2007. Well, let's just then get right into the next question, which is then through the lens of a technology investor and entrepreneur over the past couple of decades, what are some of the big changes that you've seen in the in the Silicon Valley and Bay Area in general? I think the biggest change by far has been the blogosphere starting in 2004. That provided a level of transparency to what was going on with these tech companies and what was going on in the venture firms that no one had ever had before. It was all cloistered, closed door. Um, around the ecosystem, if you will. And when that got opened up, it became a thing. It became a thing that people could aspire to. They could choose it. They could go to Goldman or they could choose Startup World. 
startup lifestyle. And then it became like a fashion. And so a lot of false founders arrived on the scene wanting to get something they thought they wanted, um, having read about it in the blogs. And um, they could very quickly start to talk the talk. But in many cases, it was revealed pretty quickly that they were false founders in the sense that they didn't have to do this. They, they, their backs weren't against the wall. The creative juices weren't so much that their brain was going to explode unless they suffered yeah. through seven years of this startup stuff to, to make something happen. And, uh, and so I think that that has diluted the, the community. I also think that the transparency has created a sense of status envy. Uh, everyone now knows who the top venture firms are. Everyone can tell you who the top five firms are. And no one, you know, people really couldn't do that back in 98, 99, when they go for the book. They kind of had a sense, but yeah. now it's very clear what the hierarchy is. And uh, that's not, I think, good for people because it makes people in venture firm number 18 kind of miserable. Yeah. Even though they're in the 18th best venture firm in Silicon Valley and they should be, then they're doing great things, they still feel like they're losing. Um, and it's the same thing for them when they talk to the founders. Founders are like, yeah, I only raised from number 18. I didn't raise from number two, yeah. number one. And that makes everyone feel, I don't know, it just, it, it, it creates a status game out of it and it makes it a game yeah. as opposed to authentic, authentic people coming with creative ideas to build authentic products for authentic problems. That's funny. This literally came up uh, two interviews ago. We had uh, Alexia Sotsis, the former exec editor of uh, TechCrunch. And she was talking about how she was part of the hype machine in a, in a way and yet shared her longing for authenticity here and how there's so much pressure to always say, everything's going well, everything's going great. And it sounds like you've experienced some of that. Absolutely, and, and, and they have to. You have to say that because everyone else is saying it and you have to attract new talent, you have to attract capital, you have to attract press attention in order to keep the ball rolling. And, and I don't see a way out for the founders. Um, at NFX Guild where I'm working and, and uh, something we started, we try to create a context where people can be authentic. Mm -hmm and have strict privacy controls within that group to give them some relief so that they can speak authentically. But you, you can't do it more broadly. You have to do it in smaller groups. That so, seems to be a theme that we keep hearing over and over again. Like there's a, if there's a breakdown that has happened culturally in the Bay Area, it's this infusion of uh, kind of meta culture. And we've lost a lot of the connections in the smaller pocket communities that yeah. I think we find a lot of personal meaning in. I think a lot of us were attracted out here, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because of the counterculture, right? I mean, the idea of picking up your roots and going and becoming a gold miner, or picking up your roots and coming to the summer of love, or picking up your roots and coming out to work on silicon chips. Uh, you know, people did this, but that was a countercultural idea. It was not the mainstream. And often yeah. it was people who were like in close encounters, just driven to do that. And now that there's so much money floating around, and now that that money is so transparent through the blogosphere or through the rankings or whatever, yeah. it, it's becoming more a culture uh, where you go to the Rosewood, my least favorite place in Silicon Valley, and they've parked the Ferraris out in front yeah. as if that's the symbol of success in our culture. And 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't the symbol of success in our yeah. culture. Having impact was the symbol of our success in, in our culture. And now places like the Rosewood are exploiting that to bring the Miami or Dallas culture here. And it just, it, I think we're losing something uh, bad in there. Well said. So one thing that you know a lot about is network effects and uh, also urban tech companies. And of course, we talk a lot about San Francisco on this, on this podcast. What are your investments is, is left? And just a year ago, it seemed you know, inevitable that Uber was going to win this ride-sharing market. Of course, ride-sharing has you know, fundamentally changed, but Uber seems vulnerable all of a sudden. Can you talk a little bit about ride-sharing, Lyft versus Uber, and just your general thoughts? So it became clear years ago that there's a, a, t a particular type of network effect inside of Uber and Lyft, which we call an asymptoting two-sided marketplace. And what that means is that as long as you have a few hundred cars and you can get me a car in four minutes, I'm going to be happy. If you could charge less, I'll take you instead of Uber. And the Uber drivers can use Lyft or Uber or a third. And the riders can use Uber and Lyft and a third pretty easily. It's called multi-tenanting. On both sides of the marketplace, they can multi-tenant. All I'm trying to say is they're vulnerable to competition and they're not here forever with that particular type of a network effect. Yeah. That's all. And so we've known they've been vulnerable. All that had to happen was Lyft had to stay in business. They had to keep getting funded, and they managed to do that. And so what you're seeing in many cities across the U.S. is the percentage ownership Lyft to Uber is now getting closer to 50-50. There are a few cities in which Lyft is bigger than Uber. 
And I think you're going to continue to see that trend. It's just going to naturally met out to near 50-50. And then there's going to be price wars. And so what they're both going to have to do is do what the airlines do. This is the same thing you see in the airline industry, where these in, these companies operate at break even or a little bit negative. Yeah. Um, and then they just use debt to keep going. You're going to get charged for a briefcase in the trunk? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's sort of the, 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 the first thing they're going to do is go to loyalty program. I see. Uh, which is what the airlines had to do because yeah. they're essentially non-differentiated transportation services. Hmm. And so I, I think that would be unwise of me to predict that Uber won't be here five years from now because they've raised so many billions and the brand is now becoming seared on people's minds. But uh, I, I think that a third party could come in and give those two a run for their money still because of this asymptoting network effect that they have. So I, I'm, I'm pleased to see Lyft doing as well as they're doing. I think uh, the Uber valuation is of 68 or whatever it was. It was crazy. I think uh, you know Lyft is more like 10, and that's great. What do you think about the Ubers and Lyfts, which are companies that have come from around here in the Bay Area, that in many cases they're filling drivers from outside of the city of mm-hmm. San Francisco. They're coming in from Richmond. They're coming in from Sacramento, yeah. working out for the day or two. Like, what is the network effect in the local community from a service that looks like an Uber or Lyft in, in your mind? The network effect is simply that people in these outer communities, like like we've had when people were growing food outside of, mm-hmm. and then they would sell their food in the city. I mean, that's essentially what's happening. They're yeah. selling their labor in the city. It's not it's no no not really different. Mm-hmm. I think it's a positive thing for the surrounding communities. I think it's it's possibly a positive thing for, for the people in San Francisco. Yeah. That's why we have cities, is that there is a network effect created mm-hmm. amongst everybody, and everybody plays their role, and everyone has benefited from everyone else being there. Yeah. Um, and so really what we should be more worried about is sort of the dying of the small towns outside of the big cities, given the consolidation of communication and wealth generation in these cities that we have. So I'm pleased to see that those people can come in and make a living doing that and then bring the money back out to their families outside. Yeah. What kind of interesting companies are you seeing right now, maybe just in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, that are getting some traction that, you know, the average person in, say, Cleveland is not really thinking about at the moment, but will have to think about relatively soon? There's, I think there's, you're going to see a, a market difference between cities before 2019 and after. The market difference is going to be that all the static advertising that we see around is going to become video. Hmm. And you're going to see it on the tops of taxis. You're going to see it on the tops of bus stations. You're going to see it in the windows of package stores. There's just going to be a lot of video advertising everywhere. It's going to be moving. It's going to be colorful. It's going to be calling for your attention. And it is going to be targeted to the street. It's going to be targeted to the time of day. And eventually it'll be targeted to the individual as they walk around with their ID on their phone. Yeah. And I think that movies made prior to 2019 will look one way. And movies made in cities after 2019 will look different. Except Blade Runner. Except Blade Runner, which already looked like that in 1982. Well, and her, and her. Her was, and her, her, her yeah. was a good one. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. And minority um, rule. I got to think as a marketer by trade, you're the first person I've heard articulate it that way. But I, I feel like that's absolutely a trend that we're already starting to experience. That like out of home buying, if you're going to, for, for listeners that don't know, like if you're buying advertising, if you buy things that are not digital, it's more complicated. Like you've got to work through arcane processes. You've got to get the creative. Let's say you're going to put a billboard up out to a third party. The third party actually has to install it. So the process is very hard, but it's not as expensive as it used to be. And so everybody's trying to apply the techniques that have been learned over the last decade in digital advertising offline. But there's a, a bunch of friction that's showing up. So I appreciate you sharing that. I like that. One topic of discussion that uh, the whole country likes talking about at the moment is on-demand economy, marketplaces. What are the implications going to be there of, you know, large portions of the workplace essentially becoming freelance? And is this good, bad? I mean, how do you view it? Is it not to be viewed through that lens? Like, what do you, how do you think about on-demand and, and, the, and work changing? So I think that for the vast majority of people, the change will be positive. Their lifestyles will improve, their control of time will improve, their ability to find the work that most compensates them and most rewards them psychologically and emotionally and whatnot. I think that's going to actually improve a lot of things. I also believe that most of the jobs that people do today have been dumbed down from what they are capable of doing. You know, I I look at jobs in the government and what 30% of our, our people are employed by the government. And there's an active process by which they're told to do less and less, sitting there stamping something. That, that's yeah. not a good way to live your life. And so I think for the vast majority of people, these types of more fluid systems will actually lead to more meaning, 
more happiness and, and more discovery of what they're capable of doing. I think for some people who might have been overtrained in, in the you know, slower ways or bureaucratic ways of doing things, it will be a difficult transition and they will suffer. But uh, I don't think that's, that's I think that's a, a small minority of people. What, uh, what neighborhood do you live in? In the Bay Area? I live in Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Yeah. And when you think about 20 plus years ago when you chose to move here, because you thought that the market was the interesting market to live in. Do you still feel the same way? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think that the city, particularly around this industry of technology, has a network effect going. Yeah. And it's unbeatable. And if you want to make a movie, you go to L.A. If you want to be in politics, you go to D.C. Yeah. And uh, if you want to do tech, you come here. And it's just we're all thinking about it all the time. Yeah. And like the, the key performance indicators, the bar, the benchmarks are so high that um, you're, you're more capable of doing more with your life and, and your capabilities than any place else. Yeah. Part of what I hear you saying is that you see the same potential advantages from a professional perspective if you work in technology. But when you showed up here and you saw it and you interacted with the community in Palo Alto, if that's where you first moved to, do you still feel the same way? Is it still as exciting culturally? No, I think it's dropped a bit. Mm-hmm. It's dropped a bit because I think that a lot of the ideas that, that this community was pushing forward have been around a decade or more. Yeah. And we haven't added too many more look this this community i believe is much more of a mindset so the design thinking mindset Mm -hmm. the iterative mindset the you know lean operations mindset yeah you take that mindset and you apply it any place in the country any place in the world any industry and those people will do better yeah whether it's participant media down in la or whether it's in space exploration with spacex this, this way of thinking around here is what this place is and that hasn't changed. We've just layered in this other sort of focus on money yeah. that, that diminishes the meaning, diminishes the authenticity about it. But I feel as if over time, I've learned that, I read this wonderful article by a, a fourth generation Californian, and he said that his great grandfather said that it was worse. And that his father said it was worse <laughs> for him than it was for his dad. And that he himself was writing as a 40 year old saying it's worse for me than it was for my dad, but it's still the best place in the world. Yeah. It, that's how great it was 80 years ago. And I, and I think that's still true of this community. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of alluded to this earlier with, you know, blogosphere, people moving here, uh, idealizing themselves as founders, entrepreneurs. The rest of the world kind of fetishizes Silicon Valley, right? We're seeing shows about it, all, all sorts of things, references in pop culture. How has this affected you, if it has at all? And uh, do you think having this sort of attention is good or bad uh, for for the culture? I, I think it's inevitable and I think it's bad. I think holding up, again, that transparency that we got from the blogosphere, we're now getting again from Silicon Valley, the TV show. And the other attempts to characterize our community have fallen far short, whereas Silicon Valley has absolutely nailed it. And, uh, and I think people seeing themselves uh, leads to a lot of self-consciousness and a lot of acting out and acting into a role they feel they're playing. And that's not good for anybody. It's, just, it's the same negative we're getting from Instagram and from Facebook and from whatnot, where the, the, the third eye, if you will, not, not just you and me talking, yeah. but there's a third eye watching us. That sense that you're being watched and that I need to take a selfie, that is a diminution of authenticity in a large, to a large extent. And we're seeing that with the TV shows. As well. But I think it's inevitable and it's actually probably needed given the level of influence that these companies, due to their network effects, now have on the world. They're kind of necessary evils, uh, these social media platforms in a way, right? I mean, they they help you get faster distribution. and 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 it's becoming more important for the world to understand how things are done here as we have more and more influence over how they do things. And up until now, it's been the Wild West, and Zuckerberg was doing whatever Zuckerberg was doing. And it wasn't a big deal, and now it's a big deal. And so, so the rest of the world... Uh, does have the right to understand how we think and what we're doing because it affects them so much. What is your view of the large platforms? So you talked a little bit about the blogosphere, but what about Silicon Valley's role in fake news? And do you view Facebook and you know other platforms as culpable in propagating some of this, or how do you think about them? Uh, yeah, I do. I do think that they need to be uh, less hands off. I think that. Any, any medium that is causing people to believe or think things that affect the rest of us <laughs> needs to have some sort of governance system. Now, my belief is that you know, Facebook through and, and Google through algorithms can dramatically improve uh, the situation from what it is now to the point where 
they don't need to hire 10,000 people to by hand censor things that go through. Right. But um, there's, there's various ways of approaching it mathematically, I think, which would be elegant and improve the situation significantly. I haven't built them myself, but I know guys who do build those sorts of things at those firms, and they're fully capable of figuring it out if, if given the license to do so. We hope those guys and girls that are building those algorithms are out there listening um, and are inspired by the discussion today. I, it's hard to believe sometimes how fast a short amount of time goes that we have with you here. I think we could probably have you back for another couple of episodes. This conversation has been so fun. Um, we're at our time, and we want to end on one question that we ask all of our guests, which is, who are you watching or listening to, or what are you watching or listening to on the networks that you spend your time on? What might be most helpful is to mention the the blog, The Edge. Yeah. That's a blog where they're talking about a lot of the futuristic science and and technology, which is um, impacting how we li- think and live and how humans derive our meaning and happiness a- as it relates to technology and, and math and science. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really this was great. appreciate it. It was an awesome conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. We are always looking for great topic suggestions and suggestions for future guests. Email us at info at thebolditalic.com if you have suggestions on either. Thanks for spending some of your time today with us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of season one.